Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. Hello and welcome to On the Record, an occasional podcast. I'm Sam Hardiman of the Daily Memphian, and today I am joined by former Memphis mayor, Dr. Willie Harrington. Mayor, thanks for being here, sir. Thank you for inviting me. And so first, you're running for office again. You're running for uh, the office of mayor here in 2023. Mm -hmm. Before we get to talking about your time as mayor, you're 83 years old now, sir. Yes, sir. What do you do for fun? What is what is on a Sunday afternoon? If you, you know you're not campaigning, this is probably not the best season for that. But what are you doing on a Sunday afternoon, Sam? You know, in fact, uh, this is going to surprise you. When you said you wanted to interview me uh, prior to the podcast, what I wanted you to do was to come and walk with me down on the riverfront. Uh, with several days of a week, I try to walk a couple of miles. I wanted to see how good a shape you were in so that when you made reference to me being 83 years old, I wanted to see if you could keep up with an 83-year-old. So to answer your question, uh, Sam, I'm, um, and also I wanted you, after we walked in the river, I wanted you to walk over to South Memphis with me where I was born, and uh, I'm reinvesting in an old South Memphis neighborhood. So to ask me what I do, I work all the time. Um, I think the last time we talked, I mean, not the last time, uh, but I was working on the trilogy. As you well know, I'm um, uh, doing my life story. And um, it's really, it's going to be a trilogy. So I've been absorbed into just uh, reflecting over my life in public service. So up until I announced that I was going to run for mayor, I was doing real estate development, uh, rebuilding an old South Memphis neighborhood, and writing uh, a trilogy. Well, whenever you want to go on that walk, I'm game. Okay, let's go. There. Let's go. <laughs> okay, let's go okay. this week. Okay. <laughs> and so moving on from that, and I guess about – uh, your book. When does your book come out? Because we've been well, talking about this me, book for a while. This is really interesting, um, Sam, and we'll get into it. Um, if you had asked me a year ago, um, would I be interested in running for re-election? I would have said to you, Sam, no, I don't think that's what I'm going to do. I'm deeply absorbed into writing this trilogy. And uh, I mean, I'm really deep into that. And uh, we'll get into this later in, uh, in the interview. Um, then um, the, the predicament that I saw my hometown uh, uh, and, and, and uh, it's just I saw Memphis at a critical crossroads. Uh, after the Tyree Nichols uh, tragedy, I witnessed my hometown image being just uh, tainted severely. Uh, secondly, when Memphis was designated as the most dangerous city in America, it bothered me deeply. Uh, and thirdly, I guess when I saw the array of candidates uh, that expressed interest in running for mayor in the year 2023. And hopefully uh, this will not sound self-serving to you, but I honestly looked at the array of candidates and aligned the backgrounds of the candidates with the challenges facing my hometown, I quickly came to the conclusion that as a citizen, 
and as one who had given so much of his life to public service, I just didn't see where any of them had the backgrounds and the skills and the knowledge uh, to really address the challenges of Memphis. So I went through a deep soul-searching period, uh, shared it with my colleague, Mike. And I said, Mike, uh, Memphis is in trouble, man. Um, and I don't see our way out uh, with these guys who are talking about running for mayor. I saw a group of opportunists. Uh, I saw a group of candidates uh, that had no experience in high-level executive leadership roles. And, and after all, Memphis is a big city. Uh, a city is a large business. It's complex. And I think I made it look easy. So <laughs> that's why you have 19, what do you have, 18 or 19 candidates. I made it look easy. So anyway, long story short, um, you know, I had to discuss it with my kids and that was a painstaking process because they really didn't want me to do it. I said, Dad, you're 83 years old. Why don't you relax? But Sam, I could not relax. I could not sit on the sideline and watch my city deteriorate at such a, a rapid rate. Then with crime. Crime being a, a priority issue, fighting crime. We'll get to crime there. Let me okay. let me follow up on okay, it. Follow up on that. Okay, let me yeah. follow up on something you said. You mentioned the Tyree Nichols tragedy. Yeah. You grew up in this city. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're born in 1940, right? Yes. What was growing up like? What was your as a as a young man? What was your relationship like with the police? Well, did you trust the police? No. Uh, it's really interesting that you raise that question. Um. And by the way, Sam, I want you to visit my neighborhood. Uh, contrary to people believing that I lived in Carryville, <laughs> I had a house in Carryville, but I had three houses in Memphis. I've been to your house. I drove by one day. Oh, you did? I oh, did. Well, you know, oh, well, I didn't uh, know that, Sam. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> but anyway, Sam, I'm back in the neighborhood that I was born in 1940. I'm reinvesting in it. I'm doing what a lot of people talk about doing. I live in the third poorest zip code in Memphis, and you've been by there. And what was it like? Remember, I, I grew up in the heyday of racial segregation, the Jim Crow era. Uh, police brutality was rampant. Describe that. I mean, what, do you, what do you mean by rampant? I was to tell you, it was rampant. I mean, uh, what I mean by it was rampant, uh, uh, we were viewed as colored people, okay? Remember, I grew up... The buses were segregated. We rode on the back of the buses. Water fountains were marked colored and white. Oh, man. Police brutality. We went to the theaters. We had to go in the side door. We had to go upstairs. Where the Orpheum is now it was a Malco theater. Uh, we had to go through a side door. And you had to sit upstairs. Uh, so it was a different, uh, whole different social setting. Uh, I'll, I'll share one experience with, with, with you uh, that uh, really causes me uh, a lot of trepidation just to think about it. Uh, I remember one evening, you didn't know I used to be a fighter, a boxer. Oh, I knew that. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. So I was an amateur boxer. So uh, a friend of mine named Henry, Henry and I had gone to the theater on Bill Street and we come out to the theater, and he says, well, uh, let's see if we can run home, man, from here. You know, we're used to getting up, running, jogging, getting in shape. So, Henry, think we can do it, man? He said, yeah. So we ran from Bill Street to Palmer Alley, which is the street before you get to Barden Street. And, Sam, when we turn off a of crump into this alley, there was a police car and they, they had, then they had the traffic cops uh, had white cars and regular patrol had black cars. Henry and I, when we ran up in this alley, we ran right up in this police car. Uh, so, so the police car uh, said, hey, uh, where are you boys going? And we're out of breath. So what, what, what are you doing? Why are you running? So we're trying to catch our breath. And we finally, I said, officers, 
Uh, we've just come from the movies, and we are boxers. We're trying to see if we could run from the theater here. So I remember those officers said, well, uh, you sure you all didn't do anything wrong? I said, no, sir. So he said, since you boys like to run, let me see how fast you can get up this alley. So take off. Man, Henry and I took off running. And I remember uh, I just felt that I was going to hear gunshots. Uh, and they were laughing. And we were just running. But I didn't, we didn't know where they were going to shoot us. And uh, we were just running. And they were laughing. And I had to be, uh, I don't think I was 15 years old, you know. So Since that always stayed 50s. in my mind. Yeah, in the 50s, yeah. So that stayed in my mind. The other one is, uh, oh, man, I was in front of uh, uh, the Gayhawk uh, restaurant. And the police had asked these guys to clear the alley. Yeah, to clear the alley. Um, and I didn't know they would ask him to leave. I think I was a teacher then. So he had to have been a lieutenant. He came up because he had a, on a white shirt. And they had a running board on the cars then. He said, I thought I told you, boys, he got out. He racked back a shotgun. He racked back a shotgun. Clear the alley. I didn't know. I had just come up there. So I can go on and on. So police brutality was uh, rampant then. Um, everything. So then later... Uh, I joined the board of the NAACP, and um, I remember Mrs. Smith, who was executive director, would share with us pictures of black men that had been brutally beaten, and the police would say they fell, and they fell down the steps. I mean, it just we would see the pictures of people just beaten up real bad, and nothing was done about it. So, you know, and being so arrested... Uh, I remember I was, oh, man, I remember uh, I'd come from Lemoyne College, and uh, I went home on Barton Street and uh, put my books down, and I went back up on the corner. There was a sundry up there. These are guys in my neighborhood, and we played a jukebox. You could play three records for a quarter. You could get a knee-high strawberry drink, <laughs> and I would come up with the guys, and uh, the police comes in there. And the police comes in and uh, looked at all of us and lined us up. He said, you, Melvin, and another guy. <laughs> and he said, get in the car. In those days, Mike, the, the police car didn't have four doors. There were two doors. So they pushed the seat back and pushed Melvin and me in the, in the back seat took us up to, it was a pure oil station, up on 3rd, and I guess that's, look, look, that's not La Cleve, 3rd Street, and uh, uh, put us in the back of the seat and had the, uh, the white manager to come out, and he said, uh, uh, oh, no, they took us out of the patrol car they called detectives and put us in detective cars, and then they called the manager out, he said, uh, you identify any of them. Uh, so he said it was not him. The other guy's name was Melvin. He said it was him. <laughs> so he pointed to me. So I'm looking now. What is the guy talking about? Him what? Uh, I said, officer, I said, may I stand up? Because I'm 6'6". Six, six. I said, may I, may I stand up? Could I get up? May I stand up? I thought once I stood up. He said, yeah, that was him. He was running so fast so a car almost hit him. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Uh, then the uh, black attendant came out. I said, I did what, sir? So they put me back in the car. Started asking me questions. I said, officer, I said, I'm really not worried. I said, because uh, at the time you mentioned this, uh, I was coming from school. So he said, he, I remember he called me Jughead. Jughead used to be a, a, you remember, it was a comedy. There was a comic books in the old days. Jughead was bald-headed. So even in college, for an athlete, we didn't have any hair. So I told him I'd been to school. I was college. I'd play basketball. Uh, so I would get out, you know, after practice and come home. He said, Jughead, what school? I said, sir, I go to college. 
I said, I go to college. And uh, I said, in fact, I'm not worried. My coach can uh, uh, you know, verify that, that I, I'm an athlete. So Mr. Jerry, Mr. Jerry walks up. And he looks over in the car. He says, uh, they just called me, believe it or not, Lil Willie. I, used, I didn't always be 6'6". Six, six. Mr. Jerry knew me since I was a little boy. So he said, oh, he said, uh, why is Lil Willie in that car? He said, do you know him? He said, yeah, I've been knowing him ever since he's a baby. He said, he, he said uh, look, and in fact, I was blessed. that uh, They had knocked some guy down and robbed him in front of Mr. Jerry's house. Mr. Jerry said, first of all, Willie would never do that. And the guy that knocked him down didn't even look like him. Okay. So had Mr. Jerry not stopped by at the time that he did, I would have been in jail. I would have been falsely identified. But I would have gotten out because I did. I was in college to play basketball. So I can go on all kinds of Yeah, and so— to, so, I appreciate I, you sharing I, all that. Oh, yeah. And so, when you see what happened to Tyree Nichols in the year 2023, does it surprise no. you? No. So, why does it happen, in your opinion? Well, uh, uh, Sam, remember, uh, you know, I was mayor for almost 18 years. Um, probably more than any of the mayors I know. I took a deep interest in police training. When I got to be mayor, I went out to the training academy. I would watch how they train police officers. And believe me, in the old days, it was much more uh, professional. It was rigorous, okay? Um, and I wanted to see how they, how they train police officers, okay? In fact, I think that's when I met, uh, I think Armstrong was like a very young then, and the other guy, Mike, was at the training academy. What's his name? He's an athlete. Yeah, yeah. So Rollins and another guy. Tony Armstrong. Yeah, huh? Yeah, Ross, Tony Ross. So I would watch them train. Uh, then I went out, took all the shooting stuff, and I shot this. <laughs> what was a, it? was a nine millimeter there and all of that stuff. So um, then I remember I met with the psychologist because I wanted to know. What were the battery of tests, psychological tests, that individuals took that deemed them suitable or not suitable to be a police officer, okay? Because I met a young man once who was distraught. I was in a grocery store, and he said, uh, May Harrington, he said, May I share this with you? He said, All of my life, I want to be a police officer. He said, And uh, uh, I was declared unfit because I didn't pass a psychological. So I look at this young man, he seems all, you know, I'm not a psychologist. And he was really distraught because he really wanted to be a police officer. He looked like a fine young man, told me how he was rear. So that, that prompted me, no, that didn't prompt me then. Later on, we had some police officers that had exhibited some inhumane treatment and I wanted to know how did they escape a battery of tests and they were deemed suitable when their uh, behavior patterns were really terrible. That was one. The other one was uh, I used to go to basketball games at Lamorne College and there were a group of guys sitting down. They were noisy. And one lady said, did you know that's one of your police officers? I said, he's a police officer. This is over at Lamorne College. I said, not a police officer, a young guy. He had gotten through the psychological and the training, but he's with gangbangers. Okay, are you following me? Mm -hmm. So he's with gangbangers. So, so when I see these examples, it, uh, it, then I begin to say, you know, how foolproof is the psychological battery of tests? So, you know, I've said all of that to say, uh, while I didn't try to run the police department, I knew the police department. I knew its ins and outs. And we're going to get to Blue Crush because I hope you'll ask me later on about uh, technology and all of that. So, in fact, uh, uh, many of my friends are police officers. Okay, So I understand the culture of the police department. 
understand police operations, and hope you'll get to this, my position on special units and all of that. And I'll quickly tell you that I believe in special units. I had them when I was the mayor. Uh, I think Chief Davis calls it Scorpion. We call ours Cobra. Okay. But I don't know. I'll wait. No, no. Yeah. I mean, go ahead, sir. No, I mean, no, so no. why why is there a need for special units? Then, well, you're good ahead. Okay. Um, let, let me first of all say the Tyree Nichols tragedy uh, 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 was an embarrassment to the uh, law enforcement profession. It certainly uh, it damaged the image of our great city. And those officers who were responsible uh, for that uh, brutal killing, uh, they should be uh, appropriately punished if they're found guilty, okay? Um, um, you, you asked me earlier, why did it happen? Let me get back to accountability. Uh, uh, when we had uh, 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 Blue Cross, uh, we had supervision. I like had a major, a lieutenant, sergeants, and all of the officers on TAC team and Blue Cross, they were carefully chosen and they were monitored. Apparently what happened in the Tyree Nichols situation, we had a group of officers that were not uh, adequately trained. They were not suitable for those for that specialized unit, in my opinion. When I was there, uh, we just had layers of accountability and we were very selective about the individuals who served on specialized units. You need specialized units. Why? Uh, you need them because crime, the, uh, the different segments of perpetrators of crime, some are youth, some deal with drugs, uh, some deal with uh, auto thefts. Uh, so you need specialized units to attack uh, the various kinds of crimes, okay? Uh, for example, gangs. Uh, I remember in the old days, uh, we had some guys, Sam, if you saw them walk down the street, you would think they were gangsters. But they were infiltrating the gangs in Memphis. We had a pretty good grasp of who gang leaders were, okay? And we had a lot of, there's a lot of police tactics that are used to auto thefts, chop shops. You gotta have people to specialize in it. Drug dealers, um, all of that. Um, so you gotta have specialized units. And so to, to ask you about gangs, you bring them up, sir, and you, you talk mm -hmm. about chop shops, and we, we clearly have an issue with that in our city given the rate yeah. of auto thefts and gang violence persists in mm -hmm. this city. What are these why, – why does gang violence still persist? The city has spent a tremendous amount of money on policing for a long time. Mm -hmm. It uses many of the same tactics you're talking about now still to this day. Why does it persist? Why doesn't the amount of effort and tax dollars and, and sweat that these hardworking officers have put in in a lot of cases, why hasn't that alienated the issue? Okay, well, Sam, uh, <laughs> uh let me give you a realistic uh, perspective on it, okay? Um, first of all, Memphis does not have a monopoly on juvenile crime. Uh, crime is escalating in major cities and some rural areas all over America, okay? Now, when I say that, the people of Memphis say, well, we don't care about what's happening in New York, Chicago, and Detroit. I understand that. We care about Memphis. But, but Memphis... Uh, it's not monolithic. Uh, uh, we're an urban community. Uh, we have a lot of poverty. Uh, you have a lot of uh, people that have low educational attainment. Uh, we're suffering from generational poverty, generational poverty, uh, uh, failing school systems, uh, deteriorating family, uh, the... the uh, deterioration of the, the work ethic, the work ethic that I knew growing up, uh, uh, the influence of the black church uh, is not what it was years ago. So 
the, uh, I guess to answer it this way, the, the American culture is undergoing tremendous changes, okay? Uh, it's because of demographic shifts. It's because of uh, uh, economic stratification. It's because of deteriorating families, work ethics, low educational achievements. And you got a lot of disparities in the American economy today. And it's reckoning. It's a reckoning period uh, for this nation. It's a reckoning period. Now, you've heard me say this before. I think you were in the audience when I said it once. Um, I'm obviously of African-American descent. I'm a proud uh, African-American or black. Uh, But what I have seen, uh, I guess in the last... Uh, say 30 years, last three decades, um, is uh, a deterioration in the core values that undergirded our resiliency as a people. I'm talking about black people, okay? Um, uh, We no longer, uh, and this is just my opinion, we no longer hold in higher esteem uh, the resiliency to fight uh, uh, to be treated equal in American society. I don't think we value education uh, the way we did years ago. My grandmother would always say to me, Willie, and I can hear her saying it right now, Willie, boy, get a good education. That is something that no one can take away from you. And the reason my mother said it like that was because we grew up in a culture where we always felt that white America always had it, uh, you know, hands on our necks choking us. And that the only way we could survive was to get a good education. Education was a pathway to a better America. And we believed in that. Today, uh, you know, that path is not followed with diligence uh, as it, okay, the work ethic, for example. Um, I remember in the old days, uh, all your skill crafting, uh, when you went on uh, residential work sites, the laborers were black. Uh, they, they did the concrete work. They did the framing, the painting, and they always had white uh, supervisors. <laughs> Today, you, and I'm not being critical of any particular groups, uh, but the majority of people in the crafts are people that have immigrated to America. So when you're an old guy like me, I'm looking around, and I'm seeing guys sitting on the corner in the alley, not working. Then I'm saying, what happened? So make a long story short, uh, Sam. I've lived long enough to see a disconnect from a rich and a resilient past that I emerged from in the 50s and the 60s. And here I am at 83, and I'm looking at 2023, and I'm looking at uh, just uh, an avalanche of young black boys who are caught up in a criminal justice system. I think you guys just did an article on uh, gun violence. Uh, gun violence has reached epidemic proportions, and we're going to get into that later on, hopefully. Uh, you know, what's the cause of all of this? Okay, and all that. But anyway, I may be rambling. No, no, no you're not I've just seen a, I've seen a major cultural shift uh, in America with regard to core values, okay? And so to follow up on that, sir, yep. you know, you mentioned— in a, in a, in a risk of sounding disrespectful, no, which I come do not on, mean, say what you say. but you are 83 years old. Yes. You're looking forward at a century that, you know, is going to go on without you. Yes, sir. And why should the city of Memphis turn to you now? Mm-hmm. What do you have to offer besides the past? Good question. Good question. Um, uh, a, a guy asked me one day, he said, uh, I was at uh, Houston's restaurant, uh, and he qualified like you did. He said, at the risk of, of uh, 
uh, insulting you. He said, Dr. Harrington, he said, uh, tell me, why would you run for mayor? Your legacy is already deeply embedded in the fabric of uh, Memphis history. That is correct. And uh, and then, then the girl said, she said, what sets you apart? So here was my answer, Sam. I said, uh, it may seem self-serving, but uh, when I look at all of the candidates, uh, it is very clear that my background, my public service career, which spans over three decades, uh, 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 makes me literally and figuratively heads and shoulders above any of the other candidates, okay? Now, what I bring to the table and to the challenge is a wealth of experience, okay, that no other candidate running for mayor in the year 2023 can cite for you to examine. I have a track record. I have a proven track record. Oh, by the way, too, uh, one of your colleagues in journalism stated that Harrington campaign does not have a theme. Uh, uh, what I'll call his name, I, I want to make sure that on your podcast, the, the Harrington theme uh, for this campaign is a proven leader. Proven leadership, okay? Proven leadership. And let me just say, um, since you asked that question, um, when I was 39 years old, Sam, uh, I became the youngest school superintendent of a major school district in America. At that time, Memphis was the 10th largest public school system. I had about 14,000 employees. The budget was about $300 million, okay? That's at 39 years old. I'm running a complex major urban school system. Nobody else can say they've done that at 39. They never had 14,000 employees, okay? Then I did that for 12 years, okay? The city of Atlanta was looking for a school superintendent. I hope we'll talk about that later on, superintendent's church. Out of 55 candidates across America, the city of Atlanta chose Willie Harrington out of 55. If you look at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, when I was selected, uh, they said Harrington must walk on waters because the board in Atlanta had never unanimously agreed. So I was a well-respected school superintendent. When Chicago was looking for a superintendent in New York, uh, Willie Harrington is, is always a, a finalist. Uh, and these are major, major leadership roles. I did my training in the District of Columbia to be a superintendent in Baltimore City. So I was in major urban cities. So what prepares me? I'm the only mayor that's presented a city budget to a city council for 18 years, a balanced budget. So what makes me, uh, it's the wealth of experience. And let me just also say this. Uh, I have a deep and abiding passion uh, for the betterment of Memphis. Um, this is a city I chose to live in. It's a city that, uh, quite frankly, in the past, I had numerous opportunities to leave. I stayed here on purpose. Yeah. So just you know, sum it all up. <laughs> Sam, let, let me just say that you're a journalist. You're a journalist. And, and you guys have not asked this question. It would seem to be on behalf of the public that the question should be raised, who among the candidates has proven to have the ability to govern a large public enterprise. Uh, there's only one, proven. You can govern. People can elect you on popularities and the demographics, but can you govern? And we have proven we can govern. I'll leave you with another statistic, and I'll get off of that. When I came into office in 1991, the city of Memphis had $3 million in its reserves. When I left in 2009, the city of Memphis had $98.6 million in reserves. Double A bond rating. 
When I came into office in 91, uh, downtown Memphis, Sam, was uh, barren, was desolate. Very few people live in there. Today, thousands of people live in there. Uh, we got AutoZone. Uh, we partnered with the Bells family for Peabody Place. We brought the ballpark. We brought professional sports here. We brought one of the biggest sporting events in the history of America, the Tyson Lennox Lewis fight. It was the highest grossing fight in the history of Showtime and uh, what's the other? Uh, HBO. HBO at that particular time. Brought all that to Memphis. International paper. I mean, just go on and on and on. Uh, came under my leadership. None of the other candidates can boast of a record of achievement. And I'll leave you with this. No other mayor in the history of Memphis has ever been designated as the best mayor in this, among cities and counties in the United States. I received that award in Salt Lake City. You know what your newspaper did here? They wrote about three inches. I was the best mayor in America, cities and counties. So I can go on and on and no, on. No, I understood. And so let me let me turn to the mm-hmm. end of your administration, sir, because you left in, you resigned in 2009. Yes. You resigned at, amid a federal investigation, which you were not indicted in. Yes. And it was because you, while you were mayor, mm-hmm. you purchased an option to sell the Greyhound facility at the time. Correct. You did not ever actually purchase it. You later sold that option for nine to one thousand dollars. Correct. And made a profit. Correct. And you were being scrutinized for all of this. Yes. And you resigned. What would your involvement be in your real estate business now, and how would you keep it separate from city business if okay. you were reelected? Good question. It's a fair question. Let me first of all say I gave you. One handout that speaks to what, when you get a chance to read that. Sam, let me just, uh, in one of my books, I describe all of what takes place in that, okay? First of all, uh, I never violated the oath of office that I took. I stood before thousands of citizens of Memphis. I took an oath of office as a mayor, and I never violated that oath, okay? Now, there were perceptions, and there was a media assassination that was driven by some of your colleagues in the journalism today that caused me all kinds of agony and stress because it was politically and it was a a collaborative effort between some power brokers members of the media, and the Justice Department to sabotage a legacy. There was nothing inappropriate about that particular transaction, okay? I was targeted. I was targeted for a lot of nefarious reasons, okay? Now, that was simply it. And so to follow up on that, you talk about your success in the past. You talk about how the city changed under your watch. Mm -hmm. Since you left the mayor's office, sir, you've been involved in real estate. Yeah. But you also tried to get back into the education business. Yeah, of course. Your charter schools did did not perform well. They eventually closed. Yeah. Why were those charter schools not successful, sir? Okay. Let me me just do this, Sam. And you have to do what you have to do. Understood. This is why uh, I look at, you know, when you're, been in public service as long as I have. Uh, it amazes you how uh, people in the field of journalism, uh, media, lose sight on what's important and what is not important, okay? All of those latter questions um, is very insignificant in my way of looking at it. If here's a guy who has spent 30 years in public service and you ask him about maybe three of those years and some events, it seems, you know, just insignificant. I think what is before the citizens of Memphis today is this. Memphis is at a critical crossroads, okay? Critical crossroads, okay? You have 18 or 19 individuals who are aspiring to lead the city, hopefully to great improvements, Okay. Okay, here's a guy Willie, who happened to be Willie Harrington, who served well. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect, okay? But his leadership made a difference 
in Memphis. So uh, I would take the larger view of Harrington, okay? What leadership role did he play for the betterment of Memphis? Did he do everything right, okay, that everybody wanted him to do? No. But the critical question is, was Memphis better off after Harrington gave leadership for several decades? That's the question. To well, me, it is. <laughs> well, no, and, and I, you know, part of the reason we do this podcast, sir, is yeah. uh, to let you, uh, in your words, be your words, yeah. and not <laughs> not truncated uh, by me, the media, yeah. um, to to an extent. You're freshing. You're a fresh breath of air. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. We'll see, sir. <laughs> no, we're good. Hit me with the hard and, stuff. No, That's good. And so, you know, to follow up on that, you didn't quite answer the question a few no, but minutes let me, ago. No, okay, let me, because I, uh, I got off a, let, no, let me explain. Let, about let your me, real estate me, business. Okay, How would you manage that? Let me, let me, let me get this. First of all, Sam, <laughs> charter schools, man, he, he, here's why when you get a guy like me and you start dealing with the media, how you have to hit them back hard because I'm going to hit you back hard because you hit me with an sure. insignificant question. Do you know how much real estate I managed as a mayor? You know how many schools? You know? When I was school superintendent, I had 147 schools under my jury. 147, okay? Yes, sir. And then I'm the, one of the best school superintendents in the nation. So you're going to come and ask me about nine schools that were your hold up. When I managed 147, one of the best in the country. So you come on the tail end and ask me about nine charter schools. Okay, hold, hold, okay, nine charter schools. On real estate, you know how much real estate you manage uh, when you're the mayor of a city? Okay, and you're going to ask me about some real estate? I don't know what, three houses? I don't know what you're asking me about. So what I'm getting at is in the guest stop, in the total configuration of government and a city, uh, uh, keep me on the on the larger questions. No, I, in, in, sir, to, to, yeah. I understand you may feel they're insignificant. Yeah, and I think what I'm asking you, sir, yeah. is you had a track record of success when you were in power, mm -hmm. and then you left office. You yeah. left office because your personal real estate business brought a and no, your ideas. No, I didn't. No, no, you. Let me tell you why I left, because you're about to tell me why I left when you don't know why I left. Well, you, I you said it was because okay. of the toll on your family. Oh, yeah, part of it. Yeah, okay. That's yes. it. Now you get at that part. No, yeah. no, yeah. Okay. You said, yeah. You've said, and yeah. you, you said to me years ago that it was because of the toll on your family and what right. all the media scrutiny had caused. That's it. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is, yeah. and what I'm asking you, sir, is that personal real estate business, which you still manage today and you still have. How would you, because it was your actions as a businessman while you're in office that brought that cloud of scrutiny, mm -hmm. would you take steps to make sure that the business and the city or the appearance of it stayed apart? Of course. Let me, let me explain this to you. When you're the mayor, you sign a, uh, a conflict of interest statement every year. Okay, you, take, you sign a conflict of interest. I've never had a conflict of interest is your perception that the media created uh, with the justice system. I never had a conflict of interest. So I'm not buying into your perception that I had one. Okay. That's fine. And so I guess, sir, to, the reason I ask about the charter schools <laughs> right. is because they're far more modern. Mm -hmm. And you just spent a period of time a few minutes ago talking about sort of an erosion as you see it in society. Yeah. And so were you encountering, you know, some of the problems, the deep-seated problems that you see in society when you were trying to manage those charter schools. No, 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 no. Let me, let me since you, uh, you're talking about just a little speck of something, uh, the charter schools, uh, to me, represented an innovative way to give all children, irrespective of socioeconomic, access to quality education. But it was a, it was a business model. Since you're on, you're on charter schools, it was a business model that we could not sustain. That was all of it. The, the, since you want to ask me that, we were paying lease prices for real estate to have a that made it economically not suitable to continue. That's just it. 
Understood. The, it it's, was a business decision to close charter schools that were not sustainable because of the escalating lease prices. That's it. No other reason. And so to, to and let me say this: Do you know how many businesses? <laughs> since you're on the side, you know how many businesses fail in America every day. Fortune 500 companies are spin off. So we're going to spend time talking about nine charter schools. In fact, you spent about 15 minutes talking about charter school. I'm not in charter school business. I'm a former mayor, and I'm vying to manage a dynamic, complex city that is larger than nine schools. Understood. Okay. And, and so to move off of that, <laughs> okay, because you, you've been on it too here since I brought it up, okay. and I did bring it up. Yeah, I would, I would ask you, sir, I guess about the police chief, about the police director. Yeah. You have not been at some forums where this question's been asked, but what do you make of C.J. Davis's performance? Let me let me say this. I'll uh, answer you this way. Uh, I will not be disrespectful to the current police chief, okay? Uh, I did not select her. Uh, she was selected by Mayor Strickland. So Mayor Strickland has that accountability question to respond to, okay? I have my own private views concerning uh, uh, the chief of police performance. Uh, I, I don't want to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to, to dilute... Uh, the perceptions of her effectiveness. Uh, I, I just don't think that would be appropriate for me to do that. Now, if you were to ask me this particular question, is the leadership of a police department critical to the success of fighting crime? I would, I, I would say to you with a resounding yes. If you were to ask me, would I make every effort uh, to hire one of the best police chiefs that I could find in America, the answer would be yes. And when you say find in America, does that person need to be a Memphian or can they be from outside of Memphis? Let me let me simply say this. I have a preference, okay? Uh, I looked outside of Memphis once uh, to find it. Uh, in fact, my CAO and I spent, what, about five days in Washington, D.C. We invited candidates from all across the country. Um and after interviewing all these candidates, looking at their backgrounds, I looked at a guy locally and felt that he was just as good. So let me give you that. If at all possible, in the talent search uh, that I could find local leadership, I have a local preference for police chief. If at all possible. If at all possible. Yes. Understood. And so I have a few more questions. You can ask right? whatever you want. <laughs> and, and I appreciate all the time you've no. given me. But, sir, you, you, this is the second time you've run for re-election since you mm -hmm. left office. Mm -hmm. And last time you faced a popular incumbent who outraised you about four to one, five to one. Yes. By quite a bit. Right now you haven't really raised much that I've seen. Like you could have raised a lot from June 30th to now, but, but I don't think well, so. Well, I haven't. You haven't. <laughs> no. You know, you are far behind where you were even four years ago. Yeah. What should that say about your viability, sir, that you haven't well, raised sir, too much money? Let, let me first of all say that uh, uh, you probably haven't noticed we've not made a, a, a Herculean uh, effort to raise money. Okay. Uh, we, we've not done that. Okay. We've not done that. Now, from this point on, see, we have, a, we have our own campaign strategy. From this point on, you will see us after, when is the deadline, the 27th? 27th of a trial, yes, 27th, sir. okay. When it is in cement, who the candidates are going to be, okay? Then for some of our potential donors, potential donors, they're going to know who the candidates are. They're going to know if Willie Harrington is still in it, if some of the guys they're supporting up they're still in it. So after... July 27th, okay, you will see us aggressively go out and uh, uh, raise funds. Now, let me also say this to you, Sam. Uh, don't you find it interesting, or you should, that the candidate uh, with the smallest amount of fundraising 
by all the polls, whether you believe in it or not, okay, uh, is probably ahead. And, and I believe that that, uh, the, that candidate uh, it, it, it margin of being ahead is bigger than what has been revealed, okay? Uh, raise no money. Does that, how, how do you, what do you think about that? Well, I'm, it's my job to ask the question. Go, you're right. Think, okay, right? Okay. They don't pay me a thinker. No, okay. <laughs> and so what I would ask then, sir, is you got 28, 29% of the vote, 28 and change, That's I think, correct. in 2019. Right. Prediction today, I think it's uh, Monday, June 20, July 24th. Okay. So that deadline we're talking about is in three days when we're yeah, recording this. Yeah. Prediction today, how, what percentage of the vote do you get? So let me let me let me say this to you: at the risk of appearing uh, to be overly confident, I think at the end of the day, on October fifth, those citizens that choose to participate in the election, the majority of those voting citizens will vote for Harrington to be reelected as mayor. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it will be clear to the voters of Memphis that Harrington has the track record, has the preparation, okay, and is better qualified to lead this city out of this critical crisis. I believe that. Now, that's a broad statement. Now, let me, let me hit you with a little demographic uh, probabilities as well. Uh, and you're not supposed to answer the question. But have you, ever, have you ever raised a question on the demographic profiles of Memphis, okay, by race? You know, people in Memphis, there's a racial pattern of voting here. It's been, and I didn't create it. If you look at the demographics of Memphis, which you have, okay, if you look at, uh, you look at it racially, you look at uh, gender, uh, you look at it partisanly, uh, you will find, I think, about 60-something percent of the registered voters are, what, 65 and older. And one of the largest cohort of that statistic uh, will be females. I have traditionally carried, especially the black female vote, which is a very significant cohort of the population, uh, I've always carried that particular vote. So to me, uh, what I have to do is to make sure that my message is clear and that uh, my base understands that I'm in this race and I'm serious about it. And I think what's going to happen, they're going to come out and vote. I don't think it's going to be a close election. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a close election at all. Uh, you had some guy that was a professional Post or something on your podcast, yes, sir. And uh, Cole Perry, of yeah, Perry Strategies. Uh, uh, and, and here's one of the uh, statements I believe he made. I would take issue with him. And I think one of your polls, said, I don't believe there's 41 percent of the voting populace is undecided, especially in the black community. I, I don't know how you how you sampling that. Uh, I, I don't think that that popular is that wide undecided. I think in the, in the white community. The white community, I think the, the voting populace is going to be more diffused and saturated, spread out among candidates than I see in the black voting populace. Let me answer your question. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I just don't see where the typical black voter is going to be confused about who the best candidate is. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, you're going to see some... Uh, People fighting for the same votes, but it's basically in that white population, not in the black. That's just my take of it. That's your take on it? Yes. As someone who's gotten a lot of votes historically yes, in Memphis. And so I asked you this question back in 2019, <laughs> and I asked you how you would be remembered, and this is what you said, okay? Mm -hmm. I think history will be kind to me because of my tenure. I've been a public figure in the life of Memphis for a critical period. They can't rewrite that. They can't write me out of history. I live in a house that I built for my mother. On the corner, three houses down, that's where my first job was. Mm. That's not my, my That's my neighborhood. You might say the legacy is maybe hometown boy, born in the heyday of segregation of a southern city. Through hard work, grace of God, he made a difference. Excellent. 
That's what you said. Yes, sir. You said that. Yeah, I said but it again I'm, today. You said it again today? Yes, sir. What would you change? I like this excellent. Nothing okay. to change. Nothing like to change. I'm glad you reminded me. Can I have that? Yeah. That sounds have, good. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. That's excellent. And so let me ask you this as I, as I wrap it up here. Looking back over your long life, what is the kindest thing anyone ever did for you? Kind of saying that. Um, I'm going to tell you. I think it was. I think it was. Uh, this may seem weird to you, but I'm going uh, to. Um, because when I told the press, they didn't believe me. Uh, Mike has heard this before. Uh, I think one of the kindest things that's ever happened to me occurred on Bill and 4th Street. I was. Uh, uh, I was a candidate to be the superintendent of schools in Atlanta, and I had, already, I had been selected out of 55 candidates. And that Friday, I was scheduled to go into Atlanta for the press conference. Uh, Andy Young was the mayor there. People in Atlanta and the corporate community in the city of Atlanta was all excited about me coming to be their superintendent. And uh, it, was a, it was a Wednesday. And I, I was going into this club on Bill and Fourth, and uh, uh, I was standing with two guys, uh, and this homeless guy, he stumbles around the corner, and he walks right, and he comes back. And, uh, you know, he looks dirty and kept. So he said... Uh, he said, you met Harrington? I said, yes, sir. Malcolm and, uh, was with me and uh, the, the promoter. Uh, the promoter, uh, Mike, I'm trying to remember the promoter's name. Huh? Powell. Yeah, Michael Powell. Yeah, it's two guys. So one of the kind of things, so this guy, he says, uh, you know my uncle. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, may I hug you? So he was dead. He said, look, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, you all we got. He said, you don't leave. He said, you all we got. And uh, I remember, man, that's when uh, uh, Powell, he said, Doc, he said, that's why you can't leave. And, you know, that haunted me. I don't even know this guy. Why did at that particular corner? And I told the commercial appeal, I said it was a homeless man. I don't even know him. And the kids that put me on a guilt trip, I called the mayor the next day, and I said, uh, uh, I'm going to have to decline. Uh, I'm going to stay in Memphis. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't know that man for some today. So that was a, he was the kindest thing. He was a man I did not know. He said, may I hug you? And he was dirty. Um uh, and I stayed in Memphis. It may sound weird to you. When the commercial people, they said, why did you change your mind? And I told them that my, but it was weird to them, but it was, uh, I don't even know the guy. You think it was fate? You think it was yes, God? Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very spiritual. Um, so that's something I've not been able to get out of me. It may sound weird to you, but I, I think this is one of the kindest things. The guy, I don't know him, homeless. He said, man, I hug you. He said, you all we got. What would you like to add, sir? Pardon? What would you like to add? Nothing. I like to stay in here. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Appreciate you, sir. In depth journalism in the Memphis community, the Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com Truth in Place.